Welcome into Courtside Seats with Kroger, a Charlotte Hornets podcast. Here he is, Chris Kroger. All right, this is a treat as we go for episode 13 of Courtside Seats, and I haren't seen this face in quite some time, and hes I feel like he's glowing for a lot of reasons, one of which uh, his countrymen's now his teammates, so we'll talk about that, but I think it really, more than anything, World Cup champions France, Nick Patum, it's good to see you, Nico. Good How you doing? Good to see you, too. Thank you. First time in 20 years, France uh, back as World Cup champions yeah. again. Yeah, that was, that was a great, great time for our country. I was a pretty good. I was in Paris when the game happened, and the the country was crazy when we won, and that yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah. So you were what ten the last time? That was ninety eight. Yeah, so do nine, you, rem- yeah, do you was, remember was, that? Do you I, remember that? I, I, I remember. I was I was nine. Yeah, nine. Okay. I was nine. That was huge already for us. That was that was huge. But I couldn't like go outside and celebrate for the other people because I was too young. Yeah. But right, yeah, I did. I mean, uh, in the, I was in the street in Paris. Everybody was outside celebrating and partying. That was that was, that was pretty good because your country is behind this team. So when we won, I mean, we all like celebrate. Like as I mean, the whole country has won. I know you know we don't care about soccer that way in this yeah. country. <laughs> uh, but it was. I tell you what, I like soccer. I try to become a student of the game and. It just felt so weird not being in the World Cup. I mean, that's yeah. such an embarrassment for our country to not qualify. And, and the U.S. have been in the World Cup in the last three or four times. Yeah. Maybe, or maybe since 94, you haven't missed it. It was just hard to like watch it yeah, for me I mean, because it was like, where's my where's my country at? Because, like, it was hard yeah, to get into because it. Because the U.S.A. is such a, the biggest country of, of sports. And maybe the World Cup is the biggest competition in the world right yep. now. So missing the U.S., yes, maybe something different. We all have theories in this country about why we aren't better at soccer. I hear people. I think this is a bad opinion. Okay, I hear this all the time. People say, "Well, our best athletes don't play soccer." I don't think that's got a lot to do with it. No. Am I right on that? I feel like that. I mean, that might be a small part of it, but I don't yeah, feel maybe, like that's maybe, the, that's maybe like a culture thing. I mean, it, soccer is not a big. It's not as big like I mean basketball and yeah. football and hockey and baseball are first like soccer is fifth sport. It's number one everywhere mm-hmm. and all around there is number one sport in the U.S. is the fifth sport. But you guys are also so organized like in France for example all the other great soccer nations like top to bottom at the youth level all the way to the pro level oh, yeah. like you're so organized in what you're teaching kids how you're teaching and, them and, raising them up and, in the programs. Really like they already play soccer. I play soccer when I grew up. <laughs> We all like yeah. that's the first time we read the first ball you play before you choose something else. We don't do that here. We do that with basketball. We that's why that, we're good yeah. at basketball. Yeah. 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 We're going to step our soccer game you, up, Nick. Yeah, yeah, you have to. You're going to be in the World Cup in 2026 anyway. Well, yeah. what do you think about Christian Pulisic? He's pretty good, right? He like, is. he's our meal ticket, I think. No, he is. No, you have a good young team. You got a good yeah. young guys coming up. And like I said, the 2026 World Cup is in the U.S., so... Well, you're the World Cup champ, so congrats on that. Thank I know you. that was an exciting part yeah. of, the, of your summer, and... Um, Man, it seems crazy to say this, but this is year number four for you yes. in a Hornets uniform. Yes, already. How wild is that? It's crazy, right? How does three I, years go by so quick? I don't know. No, when I got there, I was really excited. No, the Hornets was a team I followed when I grew up. And like I said, I, when I, it was a funny, funny story when I, when I got traded. So I talked to my wife and said, I, okay, I'm getting traded. But when I'm going to tell you where you're going to be really happy because you, she, when she grew up, she was young. Yeah. Hugo was her favorite mascot. <laughs> she loved the Hornets. Because Is that right? Hugo. Yeah. Like in the 90s, she loves Hugo. Like, she loved the Hornets just for Hugo, the mascot. And that's okay. We're going to Charlotte and for the Hornets. are like, oh, we're going to see Hugo? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my team now. That's the first thing she said. So now we're happy. Like, we're really happy, excited to be here. And, and, and we love this city. We love this, this organization. Tell me about your hometown. Let me say if I pronounce this correctly. Luso. Uh, Lisieux. Lisieux. Lisieux is where I, where I was born. I'm from a little, little town, country town, called Pont-Evêque. Pont-Evêque. Yes. What's you Pont-Evêque got, like? That, that's 6,000 people live there. <laughs> Nick, that's small. That's really small. I, I grew up there, like, my mom was born there, and now and my dad was a basketball player. Mm-hmm. So, like, we played in different, different cities and stuff like that, and my dad passed away, was three, two and a half. So when my dad passed, my mom came back home with my sister, like where she was, where she came from, with all family. So and we grew up in this little town with one gym. We only played basketball there. 
well, the, 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 actually basketball was the number one sport in this little town. So really? I started basketball there and then uh, and then I go back, I do my camp every summer in this little town. In this like little, like, that's 6,000 people is nothing. And we, that's uh, got to be the biggest thing that happens in your town all year long is when you come back and do yeah, this. Yeah, and, and, and the funny part is they this like a girl who's just now 22. She is a pro now from this city too. So we do we got two kids from this little town who pro what? basketball player. One guy, one girl, and we we play the Olympics in Rio together. What are the odds of that? I know it's crazy. Isn't that crazy. That's crazy. So we do our camp together every year. So what do you do in this town? Like, what do people do? Farming? What's what do they do to for to make a living? No, we shops. Like, we got farming shops. That that that's because I'm grew up in Normandy. And yeah, no, Normandy. People know Normandy because of uh, the World War Two. Mm-hmm. So it's very touristic. Like a lot of people come around, and I really, I grew up with like all the D days happened. I mean, I yeah. live, it's like twenty minutes away from here, so we got a lot of tourist stuff because history of this. It's you and your sister, right? Yes. Okay. And your sister was she athletic growing up too, like you? She used to play basketball, and she stopped because no, oh, that was like yeah, but your brother did this, your brother did that. Oh, she my, was sick of sister, living up to my that. My sister, she's like, okay, I'm done. And she was good though. Yeah, she was good, and 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 she stopped basketball like she was 17. And when I got drive, and I moved to the U.S. in Portland, mm-hmm. she, my sister, and my mom came with me. Cause my sister wanted to go to school, like yeah, like yeah, I want to go to the same thing I watch on TV, like high school and stuff like that. So she went to high school. Yeah, and she might not start and play basketball again because nobody knows me here. So that was a fresh start. And they say, okay, practice at 6 a.m. She said, okay. I'm no, good. I'm done. I don't want that. <laughs> she said, I'm good. <laughs> Did she go to college here in the no, States? No, no, no. She okay. graduated from high school and she went back to France. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's you and your sister and your mom. And like yeah. you said, your dad passed away earlier. Yeah. Dad, but your dad was a pro basketball was a player. pro basketball player in France, yeah. Do you know much about your dad's story? Because he's uh, Cameroonian. Yeah, that's, part Cam- of your her- yeah. that's part of your heritage. He was, he was born and raised in Cameroon. And he moved to France. He was 18 in 81. And he stopped playing basketball there. And he stopped playing basketball in Cameroon. And like that's a lovely story, like a nice story also about Cameroon. He didn't know about the game. Mm-hmm. And he was pretty tall. My dad, my dad was six nine. He was tall. He was that's big. He was a power forward. And uh, and he didn't know the game of basketball. He used to play soccer. And and there's this this white woman who was living there in Cameroon. He was married to a guy from Cameroon as well. And she was a basketball coach, and she tried to do camp like all around to these young kids. And she saw my dad, and and that's the same woman told me this story. She told me, I say, I saw your dad. I'm like, you gotta play basketball. And that woman was Joachim Noah's grandmother. No joke, Nick. That's crazy. Joachim's grandmother Mother. discovered your no, dad, dad and got him into basketball. Yeah. How small is That's the world? That's crazy, right? That is wild. That's wild. So he had really never even picked up a basketball, any of that Before stuff. That. Yeah, and so she said, "No, I got to go. He was a tall kid, so yeah, let me introduce I can't imagine game. somebody 6'9 playing soccer. Yeah, I know. I know, but that, no, that was in the 70s yeah. in Africa, so he didn't know anything about yeah. the NBA, about basketball. So, so he up and saying. moved to, to France because of that? Yeah, technically, yeah. He yeah. Moved to then he played pro in France. He became a pro over there, yeah. and he he had an aneurysm while he was yeah. he was playing. Correct. Yeah. I was. I mean, I was in the stadium. Like um, my mom was in the crowd. I was with my mom. I was two and a half, and and that's the thing. I talked to my wife. He's like, that's weird for me sometimes to play here because I see you and my son mm-hmm. on the stand because that's the exact situation that I mean I live to. So do you remember that? Uh, even I then, do yeah, you have memories actually, of that. I, actually, I do remember that night. Yeah. I mean, you, you can we can forget that. Yeah. Even if you're two and a half. I mean, when I talk to my mom, I'm like, okay, this is what I remember. I, this is true or not. And all I said was, was true, and nobody told me about it. Well, I'd imagine, Nick, like that's got to deepen your connection to the game. So yeah. as you grow up, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I would think that probably goes one of two ways. Either all of a sudden, because you see this where people say, you know, my father passed away or I lost a loved one who did this. I don't ever want to go near that again. And you push it away. Or you throw yourself into it. And I'd imagine maybe you did that with basketball. I mean, the toughest part thing was for my mom, too. My yeah. mom got to go through that again, technically. Was she worried about you at all playing? She, she, she was. She was when I grew up. She was, but she, I loved the game. And I felt like that's all, I had to do it. I had to keep going his legacy on the basketball court. I had no idea we'd end up in the NBA, actually. Like, when I, when I started playing, 
But uh, I wanted to play as a pro, like do something good in France and play in the first, second division, maybe not end up in the NBA. Do you think about your dad every time you're on the court? Yeah. In some way, even? Every time, because no, since, especially since I got drafted, I mean, like, like it must be crazy for a dad who played basketball yeah. to see his son like, getting drafted, playing the league for more than 10 years. So, yeah, think about it every time. I mean, I think about that right now with, because we've never really seen this, and we'll talk about you being a dad, we've never really seen this, I think, where the ages have kind of lined up. A lot of the people are talking now about LeBron, maybe, mm-hmm. and Bronny Jr. is a pretty mm-hmm. good high school, young high school basketball player. And I got to, th- like, you watch LeBron watch mm-hmm. his kid and the joy he has, like, that's pretty, I, it's I, pretty I, special. I can't wait. I never forced my kid to do, like, if you don't want to play basketball, he won't play basketball. But if he does, I mean, I can't wait because, yeah, I miss that. I never, I never had that in my mm-hmm. life. I got my mom. No, my mom did a great job, like, yeah. being there for me every time. But, Having, not having my dad like when I see like everybody's dad like coming to the game I never had that so I want to do that for my son yeah. how has fatherhood been it's been almost two and a half years of it now how's it been trying I'm sure at times yeah it's crazy you know and sometimes I'm too cold with him <laughs> and I'll be on the road every time yeah. I came home and he, no, I want to, I'm too cool sometimes I said yeah you gotta be tougher with him so, oh so you just want to hang out and yeah, love on yeah, him yeah, and yeah. show him affection oh well, yeah so sometimes yeah I gotta be tougher with him than I am but you know, Your wife's saying you're not the one that has to deal with them. I leave and I get a, I, I'm exactly, the one who has to do all the parenting. Exactly. So, no, sometimes that's the thing I gotta, gotta walk on and I think doing a pretty good job. So, no, he's great. He's great. No, he's, he's two, so we're in the terrible twos right now. So, it's pretty tough, but it's cool. You played soccer a little bit, though, too, right? A little bit, yeah. So when did you finally say, you know what, i got to commit to basketball? This is where my talents are. Around 12 years old. When I was 12, I'm like, okay, uh, this is where we start to focus on basketball. I moved out from my house and went to school, and I practiced twice a day and fall back from, from, from Monday through Friday and play every weekend, and then I moved to... Cause we don't do like the same stuff in, in the U.S. We don't go to school in high school. Now we go to a pro team. You play for the young team. Mm-hmm. And I moved there at 14, so a team called Le Mans, my last team before before I got drafted. And I played five years. I played two years for the young team. Uh, but after one year, I was practicing with the pro team every day. So I got two practice in a row. <laughs> I finished school at four. Got practice at 40 with the young team. To, from 4.30 to 6 and from 6 to 8 with the pro team with grown the, men yeah grown, yeah, grown, grown men grown yeah. men and at 8 get a quick shower gotta go home do my homework and then go back to sleep and do that every week we talked to Arnoldis uh, who's playing who's Lithuanian he's playing over in the Bundesliga yeah. with Bomberg and he we were talking about this with him he was 14 and he up and moved and that's still just so crazy and I, th- I, I remember for years, the narrative for people here was, well, foreign players, they're not ready for the NBA. They don't know what it's like. I'd say, you know what? It's probably the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. You've been a grown man. You've been a pro since the time you were like 13, I mean, 14. The toughest thing for us to adjust when he came over is just to, is outside. Yeah. It's off the court. It's not on the court. Because we've been against grown men since we're 14, 15 year old. No, I play against American people who's 29, 30 since I'm 15. Yeah, guys that wouldn't cut it in the NBA and yeah. they go play and they overseas. they were mad because the scout came to see me. Yeah. They were mad at me. <laughs> so they tried to kick my ass every day at practice. No, that's, that's true. Yeah, no, it's true. That's true. That's true because why are you going to see that young kid and me? I'm, no, that's, yeah. that really happened sometimes. Though. But when we come here, like my first game, my first NBA game was at the Stepper Center. And coach told me, Are you scared? I'm like, no, no, I play against crazy fans in Turkey and Greece since I'm 16 years old. No, yeah. trust me. I'm in tiny like, gyms where they're banging gym, stuff, exactly. all sorts of noise so in there. No, I'm good. So, and then one of the other cool parts about what you've done is you not only grew up in the pro level, but you grew up playing at every level yeah. FIBA basketball, too. Mm-hmm. And you've competed in whether it's Eurobasket, whether it's FIBA World Championships, yeah. whether it's the Olympics. And that's what I like, actually, too, because I got a chance to play a different type of basketball. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. I was a young kid. as a pro. I played in EuroLeague, too. During the lockout, I went back to play EuroLeague. And I played every summer for the FIBA games, Olympics, the Euro, World Cup. And then back to the NBA play. And that's pretty cool, actually, to see a different aspect of the game, different competition of the game. And I loved it. I think it's becoming you know, more mm-hmm. prevalent in the NBA. You can see over time, it's mm-hmm. what, what was once thought as, oh, that's the international mm-hmm. style. Well, that international style has really made its way to the NBA. Right. It's a free-flowing game you, now. You, you can see it because now, okay, the USA, 
they kept winning. But the gap is close. It is, yeah. You know, in Washington, 92, I mean, that was a blowout, 50 points, like 96, 94. In 2000, it became smaller and smaller because I think, like, people ask me this question, is, could the USA team is weaker? No, they're the same, but the rest of the world Stronger. got better. Yeah. We're improving. We're still far back from them because the USA is still the best country for basketball, by far. Women and men, both. But I think the gap, I mean, we got, like, like, Dirk got the MVP. Tony got the Finals mm-hmm. MVP. Got guy like got you got Embiid, Yanis, Porzingis, Jokic, like Gobert, all those young guys who are not from the US. We never didn't really I mean Embiid a little bit, but all those guys learned the game outside the yep. US. So I think the world of basketball got better. And now you and Rudy, you're the face of of the French team now. Yeah, is that does that seem? Real to you? Like, or yeah, but, is that going to take a, a an Olympic game or a FIBA championship to really kind of sink I mean, in? It really started for us four years ago, you know, for when we probably woke up in Spain. Mm-hmm. And Tony didn't come. He took like a summer to rest. He just got his baby. And that was me. I was 25. Rudy was 21. Fournier was 20. Like, we had a bunch of young guys. Yep. All, all those guys was Boris Diaw. And we played Spain in the quarterfinal in Madrid. They got Pau, Mark, Ibaka, <laughs> Mirotic, uh, Rudy Fernandez, Navarro, Rubio, Calde on the big team. Yep. We're like, we're going to get killed in Madrid. What happened? We won. We beat them. What was that feeling like after the game? Crazy. Like We, like, we had no idea. Like, we just beat them in their country. They got a big team. And, uh, and Rudy was young. And, and the thing was like, okay... We don't double team Powell. Let him play this game. And it, it, that was Rudy Gobert and Joffrey over and it's like, you got 10 fire combined. You're going to be on your own the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> we won't double team because Powell yeah. is amazing. Especially in the FIBA game. He's unstoppable. But that game was like, we Paul got, I think, 26. Mm-hmm. But their team scored 54 points total. That made me the, the greatest defensive game I've been around. That was crazy. We were everywhere. Like, I've never seen that in my life. Like, that team was supposed to score like 120 points. And you game. held them to 50, 54. 54. Yeah. With Powell having 26. Powell and Mark and Ibaka, like all those guys. And for the story, the next year in France, the Euro basket, nobody came but Powell. Powell gave us 40 and they beat us in overtime. <laughs> okay, that's a good payback. Yeah. Powell gave us 40 points and we lost in overtime. And then you'll get, what, three qualifying games for FIBA? Before yeah. the season starts, yeah, yeah. I played two already. We play like first week of July. Yep, we play two games against Russia and Bosnia. We won mm-hmm. those two, but that's that's good because now Tony retired. All those Boris Dia retired. All yep. those guys. So now it's Fournier, Rudy, Serafin, Serafin, Seraf- Nilikina, yep. Decolo. All those new guy. Me, I've heard that you're trying to get Joel Embiid on the French yeah, team. I heard that too. Yeah. Well, I would love to. Is have you can actually? You, can you imagine a paint with Gobert and Embiid? Has he been open to this? Has he actually entertained the thought? He's a fun one to talk about it. <laughs> I'm just speaking out of. Yeah. It. All right. I'm like, can you imagine Embiid as a four and yeah. Gobert as a five? Just something to think about. Even, I'm like, even an NBA team do that tomorrow. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. NBA team do that. We got Embiid and Gobert together. Be crazy. I, mean, I do that tomorrow. It is crazy. It's been three years, just over three years since you got traded. What mm-hmm. do you What do you remember about? Late June 2015, that summer, did that hit you out of the blue when you got the phone call? A Who did it come from? Your agent? Who did, when did yeah, you have my agent? A little bit. I was kind of surprised and not surprised actually because we had a, two great years with the Blazers, got 50 and 54 wins. Mm-hmm. And the last year before we got 54 wins, we got like Matthews, Torres Achilles, like two weeks before the yeah. playoff, and Flalo broke his thumb, and Marcus, I think, was his knee. So we got a bunch of injuries, like two injuries, two weeks before the playoff. And we had like 50 some wins. And Lamarcus was a free agent, and Lopez and Matthews were like, yeah, we're going to come back and keep rolling because yeah. we're young. And I got this phone call and say, okay, you're going to get moved. I'm like, really? Okay. Where I, I, I didn't know yet, like, but and then I got a call to say I'm going to move to shots. I, when I got that call, how quick were those two calls separated before you found out? Hey, they're going to trade you, and then also you found out when an where hour. How, yeah. that, that's the longest. That was the longest hour. We go, okay, I'm out, but where I'm going? 
Mm -hmm. I had no idea where what I was. What was going. running through your head? I'm like, okay, I was like, I was with my wife. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. Like, I know tomorrow I'm going to take a plane. Because I was in Paris. I was in Paris. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to take a flight somewhere, but I don't, I don't know where yet. Were you prepared? Were you thinking, hey, I could change conferences? Or did you think? I, 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 I mean, I was pretty sure I was going to the East. Yeah. I knew it won't trade me to the West. I knew it. So I knew I was going to the East. I don't know where. I didn't know where. I didn't need, heard any rumors or stuff like that. So, And then I got my agency. Okay, you're going to Charlotte, and they're going to call you. So I loved it because, no, I was, they, they came out a good. The previous year, they had a pretty good season. And I used, I loved Kemba, and, and Big Guy was good, and MKG came back. I'm like, yeah, why not? This is a good young team. And and we had a good first year when I got there. Well, 48 wins. So, yeah, we had a good first year. So that was that was pretty good. And um, and yeah, I was excited. I was excited. That, that was a crazy night because when, when I got my call and I text Wes Matthews, it's okay, it was nice to play with you. They all call me. And when I got traded, everybody knew that was over. Like West, we West was gone. yeah. They no saw the writing on the wall gone. for them. Yeah, yeah. When I got traded, I think everybody knew. Like, okay, it's over. Who was the first person to kind of reach out to? Was it Cliff? Was it Kemba? Al? MJ. Who? MJ. <laughs> MJ was That's the first it. one to call. That's a heck of a call. Yeah. What do you say? It was, it was two a.m. and I gotta say, yeah. So my agent says, "They call you in five minutes." So that I pick up my phone and they say, "Hi, this is MJ." I'm like. I was pretty good the first time. I was pretty cool, and then I say, "Yeah, I'm waiting for you tomorrow." I'm like, "Okay." Wow. So it was two a.m. I was like, "All right, let's pack up our bags." And the like, flight was at eight a.m. So did that just calm everything down right then and there? Like, yeah. okay, I just had. And then, then yeah, so yeah, the, my wife was happy, was excited, and, and we came here for the first day. And yeah, we love to see you right away. You really freed Kemba up to do things that he was already good at, mm -hmm. but didn't have that guy to take the workload. I think off his plate and take some attention away from him. That, and that, that's the thing I, I say. The first time I had dinner with Cliff, the first day. And I told him, I just I just spent two years with Damien, later, three years mm -hmm. before that. And I got it. The thing with him is I told him, like, give me the ball and play the two sometime. Run, play off the ball. And I told Cliff, I was like, I did that with Damien. He worked yep. pretty well. Let me do that with Kemba sometimes. Let me get the ball and let Kemba play off the ball. Like, because that's sometimes it's, it's tough to create by yourself it every is. time. And Kemba used to do that before because he's good at it. I don't say it's not. He's very great at it, but sometimes you need to mix it up. Mm -hmm. That's what we do now, right now. Sometimes, see, I'm like, sometimes I got the ball and we run off screen and he's running around and he got easy shot. He work on that too. He's a great shooter now. Yeah, and I think all the pieces on that team really fit together. I think what's also funny is people forget it wasn't easy. You guys um, had ups and downs. You 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 would be a few games over 500, then you'd. You were back to being a 500 team again. Really, until the All Star break, we were just kind of hanging around yeah. 500. And then after the All Star break, I believe the, we had the third best record in the NBA. We, we the, the, the trade for Courtney Lee was change everything, right? Change I th everything and I feel like that move Courtney change everything. That move does not get talked about enough, Nick. And I, Jeremy Lin was great. Yeah. Jeremy was really good yeah. here, the but Courtney, Courtney took this team to another stratosphere. Huge. It was huge because him and I, we combined together like pretty well. No, him as a two, me as a three. We combined pretty well. That was good. He, he could shoot too, he could right? Shoot, he could defense. Yeah, it was great. You guys had an intensity level that when, like, when things would just, the game was on the line. Man, you guys, you, you were locked in. We he knew. did that. Kemba did it. You yeah. had that. Jeremy had that in him. Yeah. Al had that in yeah. him. You know, Cody, Cody. Cody stepped up big yeah. time. You know, Al was in and out of the starting yeah. lineup that year. Cody really stepped mm -hmm. in big time at center that season. He got to understand and embrace his role. Okay, I'm, I'm a starter, but. Cody is great, so okay, I'm gonna come off the bench now. That's hard to that do. That was huge for us. Yeah. No, he got his he got his situation during that year, but you know, he said, okay, I'm gonna start it for the team, and I came and come off the bench, and he came off the bench. He was scoring for us and embraced that. Said, no, no, I'm a starter. No, he didn't say that. I got to be on the starting team and play. No, and that was huge for us. Well, and you did a little bit of that, like you said, with Stotts. So Terry took over for Nate McMillan. Yes. And I like Coach Stotts a lot. Good. Um, Very good coach. And I feel like maybe, you know, Cliff had some similar characteristics of Coach Stotts. But just going through that whole transition, and we'll talk about now you're doing it a second time, but a coaching change at that point in your career when you went from Coach McMillan to Coach Stotts, what's that like the first time you go through that, a coaching change? How, how tough is that? I mean, we, we needed that. And, and uh, you know, when we changed for Terry Stotts, I mean – there was a bunch of new players, new coach. When I came the first day, I'm like, 
did I get trade or what? I didn't know anyone. Yeah. And we, that was, we needed a refresh because we had a great run with the Blazers, you know, with Brennan Rowe and Greg Golden, and they got all these injuries, and we didn't, and think we didn't need to a new start. And we drafted Damien, get a new GM, new coach, and then we took off from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had some success. Actually, for three years, we had some success. So that was pretty cool. And then I came here with Cliff. That was a different story with Cliff. No, no, Terry was more an offensive mind coach, even if he liked defense. And Cliff was more defensive mind coach. So that was totally different. But with those two guys, they, I mean, what I love with those two guys is Terry, like, allow me to expand my game to be an all-around player. Like even more, and I try to say that and I can't average five or six per game. <laughs> I yeah. can't say that. Hey, and Terry, like, he said, I know, so I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to run the floor a little bit. And yeah, because your assist, I think you were at like 1.3 per game the last year under Coach McMillan, and then Terry comes in, you shot up to almost five per yeah. game. I mean, that's a crazy jump, Nick. Yeah, my career in assist was six. Yeah. My first four years, and then I got on the track, I think, at like 20 or 25, 10 assists a game. He allowed me to expand my game, like, an all-around game. And, t- and when I got here, Cliff did the same thing. This is tough because I think it depends on who you talk to. But in general, do you think your game, because you, you're a 15-5-5 five, and five guy. And I don't think, like, people say those numbers, Nick, and I don't think they truly wrap their head around how hard that is to do. Like, it's very, very mm. rare that a guy could average 15, 5, and 5 mm. for an entire year. And yet, I don't know if it's valued enough. I think it is in some circles. I think it is for basketball people. Mm-hmm. Fans, I don't know. Even where the, yeah. today's game is, I don't think fans... I mean, I can understand that because sometimes, especially with the contract they have, there's number compared to how many points you score, not the impact you have. Like last year, I had a bad year. Yes, I don't worry about it. I'm the first one to say that. that and all summer, I try to understand why. And now I figured out why. But I understand why since I got my first contract in 2012, yeah, Nick is not a scorer, but I got me, I impact the game a different way. Because sometimes I'm like, okay, look at the numbers from the guys around when I'm on the court. Just to put it into context, take last year off the table, right? So for the injury, and we'll talk about that. But. You, the first two years here, you were a 15, 6, and 5 guy over those two seasons. You mm-hmm. averaged those numbers. There are only three other guys in the entire NBA to do that during mm-hmm. that run. Do you know who the other three are? LeBron, James Harden, and Westbrook. Yeah. They're more like 30, 10, and 10. No, and that's crazy. No, okay, <laughs> but yeah. agreed, right? Yeah, but, but how crazy yeah, yeah. is it like everybody, oh, it's no. so easy. Well, if it's so easy, everybody would do it. You were one of four guys in the league mm-hmm. to impact the game in a variety of ways. You had, at one time, you had a 5-by-5 five five game, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is nuts. Like, nah, nuts. you had five points, five rebounds, five assists, five steals, and five blocks yeah, in a game. I remember, yeah. What, you remember I, that game? Yeah, I remember because that was really my first 10 assist game. So, I, I mean, I was more impressed by the 10 assists. It was the next day. Like, I think it was Jay Triano for his year with us. And he told me, do you know we had a 5x5 five five last night? Like, what? You I didn't even I, realize. I didn't know what it was. And I think, I like, yeah, you got 10 points. Six rebounds, ten assists, five steals, five blocks. There hadn't been one in the league in like six, six years, years you, since you, you did that. The eighth guy in NBA to do that ever, ever. I'm like really? He say you a ten assist. Say you and Dr. J only. I'm like so. I'm the only guy ever with Dr. J yeah, to they, do that. Can we I get that printed that. somewhere? Where do I, I, I get that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take, take that. that. <laughs> so, but that's the rare impact I think guys can have on the game that the stat sheet belies you sometimes mm-hmm. because people look at a stat sheet and they say, ah, well, and you have games where you'll score 30-plus, you'll have mm-hmm. games where you'll go for 25-plus, 20-plus, mm-hmm. and impact it mm-hmm. in, in multiple ways. But on the whole, to see numbers like that, I think people say, ah, that's nothing to sneeze about. You know, it's nothing fancy, but mm-hmm. it's hard to do. It's really hard I mean, to why, do. Why would I really take proud of when I play is like about my teammates. Like when they say, yeah, it's cool to play with Nick. We want to play with Nick. You know, last I had a bad year, mm-hmm. when the guy was like, dude, we want you. We love to play with you. So not, and I like, I mean, that means a lot to me because I know I had a bad year last year, a very bad year. I know, I know why. But that's or what, that's my view of my game. You know, so I, I always played the game like that way since I'm five years old. Yep. I've never been a scorer. 
Now I've been named the MVP of the Euro Championship when I was 18 by scoring 13 points per game. <laughs> because I, I, want, I got the impact on everyone, and that's what I want to. One of the things that I think last year you talked, you just talked about, you're trying to figure out, okay, what didn't go well for you last year? The injury is a big part of it. I know last year we talked a lot about the continuation rule, which got changed. And I feel like that impacted you almost more than any <laughs> oh, yeah, player in the NBA, yeah, yeah, Nick, yeah, yeah, because yeah, you were so <laughs> adept at curling off that screen, yeah. especially behind the three-point yeah. line, drawing contact, and knocking down the shot. And yeah. I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but you had to be near the top of the league in terms of, of three and yeah. one situations. Yeah. And uh, really, that rule affected yeah, you. It got that, taken that away. It took me like at least 40 free throws last year. Maybe. I Isn't maybe. that crazy? Yeah, it's a lot. So how do you? What do you do to adjust on that now? I still a foul. I still a draw yeah. foul. <laughs> yeah, I keep doing it because sometimes it give you like give you a team fouls quicker. Well, I feel like this is the unintended consequence of every rule that ever gets made. Where I think we can all agree, like in the spirit of basketball, the guys that draw contact when they weren't really shooting mm-hmm. had never intended to shoot, but they got their man up in the air, and so that's what they're trying mm-hmm. to do. That's not continuation, right? No, but what yeah. you do is a basketball play, yeah, and that got taken I can, away. I can't understand because maybe guys like you, when you play with the rules, sometimes it starts. So I can't understand why they changed that rule. Yeah, I can't do anything about it, so i got to move on. What are one of the other things you think you look back on last year and say, no, okay. la- the, the, the thing is, last year was the first time for me in 14 years that I didn't play mm-hmm. with the national team. So normally I've stopped practicing, like walking out with the national team, like late June. So got June, August, September when I got practice and win a game. And so when I came back here for, I came back to the U.S., I'm ready to go. And last year, because I needed to relax, I was tired. That was my first summer off. I got my son. I didn't take the summer as seriously as I wanted to. I can't say that now. Mm-hmm. When I see my summer this year, last year I was like, okay, maybe I chill too much. And that really, like messed up my whole season. So you injure your UCL in your elbow, which mm-hmm. is really almost like you just don't, it's, not a, it's kind of a freak injury. It's not a basketball injury you see very often. It's almost a pitching injury you see yeah. in baseball. And, you know, you got some advice of, okay, do you get surgery? Do you not get surgery? You elected to not get mm-hmm. surgery. What was going through your head just those few weeks in, in the preseason? And uh, That was tough because we didn't make the playoff. I needed to play the same so- the, the so- all summer. I have no training camp, no preseason. I missed the first two months. I, was, I never like that many times without playing a basketball game. Never in my life mm-hmm. that happened from April to November. And I was and the last summer because that was the first time I got finally time to have no game. I work I work out on my game, I work a lot but not the way I should have. And that really messed up my whole season. That's why, I mean, this summer I never worked and I got people who say slow down. I mean, no, I'm not slow down. Like people like I got my agent or trainer is like, no, no, day off, get out of here. Did you, so did you feel pressure at all to, for that very reason to think, yeah. okay, may, I typically have played all summer, I haven't played, I want to be mm-hmm. out there. We, you felt almost pressure, man, I need to do what I need to do to be on the court. And, and if it's rehabbing to get out there, mm-hmm. that's what I, you felt that pressure last year? Yeah, and I came, to, came back too early. I came back like literally, literally a month too early. Like it's it's got to be tough because that, that mindset of, well, I'm going to have surgery, even though it's not saying, well, I'm not going to be with my team, it almost feels like that, right? Mm-hmm. You almost feel like you're letting your teammates down and you don't – it might be the best thing for you, but you don't feel like it's the best thing for your team. Even though it actually might be, mm-hmm. that's got to be a hard thing to try to wrestle with that. It is. No, like, like I said, I mean, I've been working all summer – Maybe not as much as I needed to because I didn't know how to, what to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the first time I'm like, I think I did it good. But when I see what, what I'm doing this summer, I didn't do that last year yeah. the way I'm doing this summer. I mean, this year I work out a lot on everything. And I think there's just got to be a rhythm to that, right? Like your body recognizes that rhythm yeah. of what you're supposed to be exactly, doing this time exactly, of year. Exactly, but I find I say, no, I'm going to stay August. I'm going to be home. I'm like, the first time in 14 years. I'd be home and I got my son I got my wife or I walk out every morning but then I was like more relaxed yeah because I, I, I needed that mentally I feel I feel I needed that and they mean no I'll be right be back to the league and get my rhythm back and so it's gonna be 10 years so I get my rhythm that was the biggest mistake I ever made Jay Hernandez one of our assistant coaches mm-hmm. who's Kemba's skill coach yeah. dating all the way back to 
to, to UConn. Evan Fournier's worked with, mm-hmm. with Jay Hernandez. And he goes over and meets you in Paris. Mm-hmm. And you're doing two a days with Jay Hernandez. And he said, You were telling him, No, coach, let's come back in a yeah. few hours. I want to put in mm-hmm. that work. So, what, what, I guess, one, what was that experience like with him and what a bonding experience? And then, two, what did it say for you to have a new coaching staff? And this guy came and met you where you were, le- literally left no, that, his country. That was the first time I had that, like a coach from my team to flew to Paris. That was big time for me. And I was like, You guys are very committed. I loved it, and uh, you know, and yeah, we practice at seven thirty a.m. or eight a.m. every morning. I said, okay, let's do four or five p.m. tonight. He said, you're eleven. You yours eleven. You want to do twice a day in June? Yeah, why not? And in between, I got lift. I got a lift in between too. So it's three like, workouts. It's like, it's like you crazy. You, this is your yours eleven. Yeah, but. F- last year as a team and personally so I gotta give back to it and that team needs me and I need to do that how cool is that to just get to know him on a personal level you guys have to imagine right like you guys you're eating together you're spending time yeah. together at times too so how, how important is that and, he was huge and, and Fournier told me like told me that said, you're gonna love him he's like, a cool dude Fournier's like you're gonna it's funny was jealous because he, I had him for four years he's like I want to be with you right now, but I can't. I'm not allowed to, but you're going to love him. And he had a great, great moment with him. We had spent two, three weeks in Paris, and, and yeah, we had a great time. And uh, went and did it with Billy in Spain, too. Yeah, he did. Which, the, I, to your point, it's just that's not, it's not common. And that's really a great yeah. way, I think, to ingratiate yourself with a locker room and show, hey, we're serious. We're, you know, it's one thing to say we're about something. It's another thing to actually be about something mm-hmm. and... Yeah, he's 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 intense. He is. He is. Uh, Jay Hernandez uh, yeah, is intense. And, and people told me like when I say when I was looking, I was talking for you. Say, hey, it's gonna be different with him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he was. I mean, he did some stuff. I mean, he told me like, I'm gonna feel you like you bad at basketball. You know what's great about him? He does. It, Kemba's show mm-hmm. talked about this. He does everything. He tells you, hey, go do this. He can do it himself. Yeah, he's way better than you. I, like, trust me, say, I'm like, you should sign 10 days just in case. He can play. He can still play. Oh, yeah. I'd imagine you get stuck in, in maybe the same routine and mm-hmm. training methods and to have a guy come in and say, no, let's think about this in a different way and show you new things. Like, that's got to it's gotta be fun and challenging to you. Yeah, yeah that, that thing, that was different. And I never really had that in my career. So, uh, I mean, yeah, every morning I was like, if that was something new. We never had the same workout, never had the same drills, never. Hmm. And we compete every day, so that was pretty cool. What was your first interaction with James Borrego? Was it a phone call? Uh, yeah, a phone call. So when he, he had a job, I mean, somebody gave me his numbers, and and we talk. And I was in California doing a rehab for my Achilles. I did my rehab for my Achilles in 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 May in LA. We flew there. We had a lunch together, and uh, and that was yeah. I had a great vibe with him right away. Like from day one, and he understand me. He talk about my new goal, like new goal for me, the way it's gonna make me play, my new position, and everything. So, pretty cool. Had you heard of him before? Were you aware of him? Yeah, yeah, I heard about him. Yeah, he was a coach in uh, in Orlando, mm-hmm. the coach, and I was pretty close to Monty Williams, so too. So I knew he was in New Orleans as well, and of course San Antonio. Somebody uh, had used the word to describe him. I think it's a pretty good way to describe JB as. If you could boil it down to maybe one word, intentional. Yes. You like yeah. that word? Yeah, I agree. Everything he does, I feel like, is intentional. Everything, every word, every move. I mean, he has a purpose on everything. And you feel like he's so measured. He he is. So, he's just got a different personality about he's him. He's going to be different than Cliff. Yeah. <laughs> he's more calm. Yeah. No, sometimes when Cliff got mad, he needed to be get behind enough to scream a little bit to work us out. He's not like that. They're going to, okay, but we have one. We can do that as a player. Yes, we mm-hmm. had one. He did it this morning. And that's why I like him, but he's good. He's great. The staff, Jay's one of those. Ron Norred, Jay Triano, who you talked about, mm-hmm. Dutch Gately, all the guys that are part of the staff, Chad Iski as well. Mm-hmm. I heard JB talk about this the other day where he said he wants a staff that looks different than him, talks different than him, sounds different than him, thinks different than him, Mm -hmm. because he wants everybody to be challenged. He wants to be challenged every day. He doesn't want to assume that he's got all the answers. Yeah, Yeah. and and I like Dutch. He's great. I I had Dutch in in California Mm -hmm. for 10 days. He came. We practiced twice a day. Also worked out twice a day together. 
Triano had him in Portland for two yep. years, so I'm really close to him. We're good friends. We like we like talking trash to each other, but no, he, he's a coach for Canada. I'm from France. Yep. We play against each other a lot. So, but he's a great, great coach, great dude. And all those I mean Jay, I had Jay a couple of times in France, but yeah, they're all different. That's a good thing. They all different. They all have the same goal. So, did JB come to you and say, "Hey"? You know, we think we might slide you over to the three. Was that you coming to him? What, what's going on? Because that seems to be something that's... I mean, I thought about it a little bit because when I think about the best year I had with this team was my first year, and I was a three with Courtney. Mm-hmm. So I was like, maybe for me, because that, that's my natural position. I can play the two, but I'm, I'm a really shooting guard. Maybe not. I think two years ago was the best. If you don't count James Harden, James Harden is, is a point guard. I was number one in rebound and assist for a shooting guard two years ago. But I was 15 in scoring. You know, last year I think it was very tough for Malik. I, I you know, when mm-hmm. you get thrown into this league as a rookie, uh, as an as an 18, 19 year old rookie, it's always hard. And then mm. you're trying to learn a new position on the fly. Are I you on the ball, think, off the yeah, ball? I think Malik needs to. He needed a year like that. Tough year. You need that sometimes to be a good wake up call. Nick, he took a week off, that's it. And he's just been in the gym working I nonstop too. since. Yeah, me too, I think I did. Because we end up playing the 13th. I stopped practicing the 18th. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, I think we got him and I, we needed that. And and uh, and I think with him, and when I saw him play like for the last two days, I'm like, I think he, he got it. But that's that's normal. Maybe yeah. 18 year old, he from a real country town from Arkansas, spent a year in Kentucky and moved to the big league. You have to understand. Oh, and then um, everybody telling you how great yeah, you yeah. are or how bad you are on either yeah. side. You get people saying, what's wrong with him? Mm. He's a bust, which is crazy. And then you get other people saying, he's great. He needs to be playing mm. all the time. And you just get torn in so many different yeah, directions. That, that, that stuff, and I understand that sometimes you need, you got so many infos coming, like you say, from every aspect. So and I think you need a good summer to reflect. Because I talked to him a lot last year. I'm like, I've been around CJ. I always say that I've been around CJ. When yep. CJ was a rookie, he was like you. Same thing. He had to understand how to play in this league. Now CJ is great. CJ got hurt his first year. We see from little school. He was a great scorer. He came in the league, and he got hurt. And then the second year, he didn't play because at Wesleyan with Barton. So he had to understand it. Now he got it, and he's a great pro. And CJ is one of the best players in the NBA right now. And I think Malik is the same as CJ. Maybe can be better than CJ. His shooting ability is just uh, it's so flawless. It's crazy. I, yeah. That's why I told Tony. So you're going to see him. He's going to be great. And he's, he's great. Tony Parker. You, uh, by the way, you went full Adrian Wojnarowski this summer. You broke the news. You dropped a, a Batum bomb. He wanted bomb. me to broke the news. He asked me to broke the oh, news. Oh, is that right? Tony, Tony did. Yeah, he'll say, okay, done did. I want you to broke the news. But How much of the, part of those conversations says, were you of him maybe coming that was, here? That was pretty funny, actually. He called me in May. We talk to, like every day because you know, we have a team. We bought a team together in France, so mm-hmm. we manage a team together for the last two years. And uh, and it was in May. He said, "When are you coming back to Charlotte?" I'm like, first week of June, I'll be in town." I'm like, "All right, let me. I'm gonna fly with my wife, and let's have a spend a day together. I want to talk to you, a couple of things with you." Because we had about, the, I thought it was a team, and we talked. Yeah. So you didn't think anything was up at this point? No. You just thought this is you needed to talk business. Yeah, yeah. So no, we friend. Uh, his wife, my wife, the friend. So it was okay to spend a day together. So I go pick them up at the airport in the morning. We got lunch my, in my house, and so we, we start talking. And everything is like, we had JB. I know, I, I know JB for the last fifteen years, San Antonio. I'm like, yeah, I know. And I'm like. So who you got behind Kemba? I'm like I don't know. That's what we need. We need a we need a good backup point. I mean, you can, you can be a good fit for us. And we start talking about it. So had he talked? Do you think he had talked to JB or Mitch at all at that Not point? No, yet. So that's what the, the next day when I came back to walk out, I said, JB said we got a shot at Tony. You told JB that. Mm. What did he say? Say really? I'm like. I think we do have a shot. I think he's going to talk to San Antonio first. You see what the Spurs are going to say. I think if we do something not work out with the Spurs, I think we have a shot. Tony and I, we're really close. 
and we talked. I, don't, I didn't think he would do it. I think he said, I wanted to talk to the Spurs. He wanted to end up with San Antonio. If something don't work out with the Spurs, why not? He still can play. And like this morning, like for an example, he, didn't, he, he got there last night. So the first day Monday he didn't do it. So he, today in practice, we start five on five. And I throw a lob to Michael Gickery, same KG. And we missed. As I, that was like the second player of the first game. He said, all up, stop. Everybody come here. And he stopped screaming at me in front of everyone. He's killing me in front of everyone. Do not throw a pass like that ever again. Don't, don't do this. Don't do that. This is over. I mean, a screen at everyone. And Malik said, we needed that. That's exactly what we needed. I, he can't. He bring this culture, like this first thing. I mean, he had four rings, five. I mean, people respect him. And I was, he's been there for less than an hour. He always stopped practice to scream at everyone. And the practice, like, the, the rest of the practice, he felt like we've been there for three weeks. Not everybody can do that. No. Not everybody can step no. into it, that spot and say, oh, yeah. Because there are guys who would have, mm. that, that have done that probably, yeah. not necessarily here, mm. but in other situations where it's like, all right, I'm going to make this about me or I'm going to put my mm. foot down. But, man, you got to have the resume to do that. Six-time All-Star, four-time champion, finals and, and, MVP. And he went at me first. And because people know we like this, we close. And when he went at me, like, like not as a friend, he went at me like crazy. He's been winning at me for the last 10 years every summer, so yeah. I'm used to it. He wants to win. I play with him every summer. The guy gave me, like, a gold medal. He gave me, like, big game championship for the French team. I have a ton of respect for him. I love Devontae and Miles. Mm. I think they're mature for their age. Mm. And Devontae, especially a four-year kid. He's 23, actually, because he mm. played an extra year prep school. Mm. Big 12 player of the year, consensus All-American. And, I I mean, for him to come in and learn behind it's him, for them. it's going to be huge. Kemba even to learn and take some of the tools from Tony's game and work it and, into and, his and game. And that's why, like, people ask me, like, I think that's a, that type of guy we need, like, a vet, he still can give you like 15 minutes. He still, he still has it. No, last year he came back from injury, and and that's why he, wa- he wants to play. He wants to prove he's not done yet. I mean, he's a guy that he has a great work ethic. His body language, everything he does off the court is great. He's great. So the guy still, he still had it. I mean, he won't play 35 like he used to. But, but 15 to 20 minutes a game, I think, yeah, is a number that's yeah. reasonable. And, and he knows the coach. He knows the coaching staff. He knows everything. And and late game situation or in a locker room we need to speak to someone or to talk to someone we need a guy like that Nick I've been saying this all summer because you were in this spot two years ago after that trade because you were in the final year of your contract Mm -hmm. so all year it was well is Nick going to sign somewhere else is Nick going to go to another team and as someone like you who's now spent three years with Kemba um, and you're around him every day I just don't think people truly understand this guy's just wired different. Like, he's just, he's not like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I keep getting amazed. I I shouldn't even say amazed. I just Mm -hmm. love seeing him every, all the time when people are asking him. He was in New York doing his NBA NBA PA camp Mm -hmm. with with his kids. And he was doing his his Jordan brand camp up there, too. And people keep asking, hey, you want to come home? And he says, nah, I just can't picture myself doing that. I love Charlotte. I Mm -hmm. want to do things nobody else has done here. I'm committed to that. Mm -hmm. And it's not lip service for him. Like, this guy's just wired different, Nick. Have you talked to him about I mean, some of this stuff I yet? Or I won't talk for Kemba. God, I don't know what he's going to do for his situation. All I can say is, yes, he loved that city. I know that. I really know. He loved that city, that team, and that organization. He loved it on his jersey. Yes. I don't know what he's going to do. I'd be shocked if he leaves. I don't think he's going to leave. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he loves. But you made the same decision. You said, because you, you technically could have gotten more money from another team. You could have gone to other teams. Mm-hmm. And 12 o'clock midnight, you're in Dallas. Hornets are there. And you say, I wanna, I'm want i committed to this. I'm committed to Kemba. I'm committed to this city. Mm-hmm. I'm committed to this team. And I want to, you know, it's off the playoff run. Mm-hmm. And now you guys are trying to get back to that and push it forward again. But you had the same urge in you because you wanted you wanted to say you know what this team took a chance on me I want to I want to I want to pay it back and I want to yeah. do it here. Yeah, when I when I, I got traded like I had a good year. I mean, Cliff was great. Kemba, we Kemba and I were a good connection. And I'm like, yeah, I got a ton of phone calls, all stars calling me, come join us and stuff like that. But because yeah, like there's a tempting like we want to play with you because you're the guy who's gonna mm-hmm. facilitate and be great because. 
if I take two shots, I mean, people loved it because I'm going to take only two shots. That yeah. was more shots for, for them. everybody else. That's, I mean, that was the whole thing since I'm being in the NBA. I mean, I'm a rookie year. I played 77 games. I start, I was 19. Because I said, yeah, we want to be with Nick. We want Nick. It's crazy, yeah, because you didn't play the first, what, three games your rookie season yeah, and, then and then you're in the starting the lineup. Yeah. yeah, but Brennan Roy was like, I want Nick. Yeah, next I want this me. guy. <laughs> I like Brennan Roy say it, so yeah. Listen to listen to Ben and Roy. Yeah. <laughs> it was great though. Yeah. It was great. But yeah, Kemba is like I don't think Kemba is gonna go now we never know, but he loved that I think he loved that team and I won't talk for him, but yeah. You're a cook, right? You like to cook? Yes. Okay. How often do you cook often at home or is this just something that's like a slight hobby of yours? No, sometimes. Not every time, but okay. yeah. What are you into? French cuisine or you into other styles of, of cooking? Uh, I mean, I like to do everything. I mean, sometimes, like, on Facebook, I follow, like, uh, a lot of cuisine stuff. So, when I see a good recipe, I try oh, to Oh, I'll it. try that out. Yeah. Yeah. So How I would your wife food. grade you on your cooking skills? Yeah. Oh, not good. Yeah. She's like, no, she says, she, I, I don't know because maybe she loves me. So, she's like, okay, that's good. But I don't know if she's says nice to me, if it's true. What's your go-to dish? Like if you're trying to knock her socks off or you're, you're bringing somebody over for dinner and you really want to welcome them into your house, what do you, what's your go-to dish? I do an African dish. Ooh. Yeah, I want to yasa. It's rice. It's basically rice, onion, and chicken, but it got a lot of spice and sauce. D- and no, you're speaking like my that. language right now, Nick. It's really, really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll end with this. And you just talked about the first call you ever got with the Hornets is Michael Jordan calling you mm-hmm. up. But I also know Scottie Pippen's your idol, right? Yes. That's who you've modeled your game after? Exactly. In the NBA? Yes. So if I tell you right now, game of two-on-two is going to be played in an hour here at Spectrum Center. Kemba's on one side, you're on the other side. You get first pick. And the two guys you have hmm. to choose to play with are either Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen. Who's on your team? That's your tough. boss man or your favorite player That's growing tough. up? Who are you picking? Ah. <laughs> choose wisely here. <laughs> can't do that to me. You want to say Scotty. I know you do. I can see it. I mean, they're primal right now. Oh, prime. We'll say prime. the prime. Prime. You got to go. Eh. I take Scotty. Okay. Play against MJ. That'd be and, fun, and I, right? And I take Scotty guarding MJ. Yeah, because then you, it's like, okay, you got him. I don't have to deal with that. And <laughs> I then, got Kemba. I like Kemba. Is good, yeah. I got Kemba. Yeah. And you want to feel like, <laughs> could I be the guy to knock him off? You want to see if you yeah, could be yeah. that guy. Yeah, yeah. We never know. Maybe I, I can't say I beat MJ. And I got my favorite, my idols. It's been great to see you, man. Seriously. You. Welcome back to Charlotte. Thank Good luck you. over in, in the FIBA games. And then um, we'll see you in Chapel Hill for training camp, okay? Yes, sir. Episode 13 of Courtside Seats, and that was a fun hour spent with Hornet swingman Nick Batum, and so it sounds like it's going to be interesting to watch him maybe slide over to the three uh, at times uh, for this Hornet squad. Some lineup versatility under new first-year head coach James Bragg, and we'll see the squad getting ready to take the court. And it's amazing how many guys are here and around the arena just nonstop right now, have been that way all summer. And uh, we're going to watch this thing uh, hit the court in Chapel Hill for our preseason opener. That'll be September 28th against the Boston Celtics at the Dean Dome. It's going to be a lot of fun. As always, check out the podcast if you've missed any episode. You can find it on YouTube, on our Charlotte Hornets YouTube channel. Just search Courtside Seats. You could search Charlotte Hornets, any of that stuff. Subscribe there. You'll get pushed all sorts of great content. Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, you name it. We're everywhere, including Apple Podcasts. Same thing. Search Kroger. It's my name, K-R-O-E-G-E-R. You could search us by Courtside Seats, Charlotte Hornets. You'll see it. Click it and uh, just subscribe. And also, make sure you leave a review and rate us if you don't mind. And we'll catch you guys back here, as always, next week with another edition of Courtside Seats. Courtside Seats.